ADD, autism, sensory processing disorder. It seems like every week, I know a family whose child who's being diagnosed with one of these conditions. And the number of children in the United States with special needs continues to escalate at an alarming rate. I would hedge a bet that every one of you in this theater today knows a child or has a child with one of these diagnoses. As a lifetime educator, I'm a little alarmed and overwhelmed sometimes when I think about the number of children who sit in my classes in front of me every day with a verifiable neurological condition. 20 years ago, it might have been one in every class, and now I have five or six or seven. And in many cases, these children were developing normally. But then something happened between the ages of 15 and 24 months, and they began to regress, and the skills that they had were lost, and new symptoms developed, particularly in autism. In my private practice, I've even come across several children in the last year who, between the ages of two and four, had a set of severe seizures or a stroke. Can you imagine a stroke at the age of two? And much of their brain development up until that point was wiped clean, receiving a diagnosis of traumatic brain injury or cerebral palsy. Now, the biological and medical causes for this uptick in students with special needs is another talk for somebody who has different letters after their name. But today, what I want you to know is that there is hope for our children. There is hope. There is hope for kiddos like Joey. Isn't he beautiful? Bright-eyed, nine-year-old little boy. And although his was a complicated pregnancy, up until the day before delivery, he was moving normally in utero, according to the ultrasound. But something went terribly wrong during the birthing process, which doctors still can't explain. He spent several months in neonatal ICU and ultimately was diagnosed with a severe form of cerebral palsy. He's had several surgeries over a short lifespan, but has made very little developmental progress. He never rolled over on his own, he didn't crawl, he can't walk, he can't hold himself up, he has no speech, and he's fed through a feeding tube, a G-tube. But he's attentive and animated, and as you can see, has a beautiful soul and a contagious laugh. And a few months ago, I had the opportunity to start working with Joey, and his results have been quite fantastic. Because you see, the brain is a remarkable thing, and when it's given the right input at the right time and the right way, amazing things can happen. And research in the area of neuroplasticity has exploded in the last 10 to 15 years. And we now know that the brain can change rapidly. And Joey is a perfect example of what can happen. Five months ago, he couldn't lay flat on his tummy on the floor because of the severe spasticity that he suffers from. He couldn't lift his little head up off the floor, and he couldn't roll over. But today, he can, using a practice called primitive reflex integration. Now, you're probably wondering how, and that's why I'm here today. <laughs> but have you ever held a newborn baby? You look at them, and they just they seem so helpless. You're like, where is the manual? They can barely see, they can barely hear, and what their perception of the world is really limited to what they can put into their mouth, right? But somehow, by the age of three, they're running, walking, talking, leaping, identifying colors, numbers, shapes, speaking in full sentences, exerting their will. Mine, I do it, starting the graying of your hair as you think about her as a teenager, right? <clears throat> But how do you get from this helpless infant to this fully functioning mini-human being in three years' time? How does that happen? Well, the answer is simple, and it's the key to helping kiddos like Joey. And the answer is movement. These movement patterns, called primitive reflex patterns, are actually genetically encoded. From the moment of conception, our brains know exactly what our body has to do to develop our brain and pattern out our system. We can Google a developmental chart, like the example behind me. We know exactly what our babies are supposed to do and when. We know when they're supposed to lift their head up, roll over, sit up, crawl, creep, walk, and talk, right? And if they don't do that within a specific time period, we say that they're delayed. We know that something has gone wrong. 
Now, it's very exciting when our, when our newborns first began to control, gain control over their little bodies. Little Joshua's laying on the floor, and he lifts up his head for the first time, and he takes a look at the world. We know instinctively that something big just really happened. And when the crawling starts, we're on Facebook Live, thanks to Isabella, Grandma's on Skype. We've called the 7 o'clock news. It's breaking news, folks, right? We know that, that there's been a rite of passage that has been crossed. But I would submit to you today that these movements are not just about getting somewhere. They're not just about mobility. They're actually responsible for mapping out the very complex nerve net of our brainstem, the oldest part of our brain. Our brainstem takes in all of our sensory information, processes it, organizes it, and disperses it through the rest of the brain. It allows for the synchronous, uh, unconscious movement of our bodies later contralateral movement, and finally intentional movement, like the first time a baby reaches for a toy purposefully to shake it. That's intentional movement. In fact, these movement patterns are responsible for moving us out of the brainstem into the higher levels of the brain and the cerebral cortex where learning and speech occur. <clears throat> now, I'm going to get a little geeky on you. And uh, if you know me, you're like, you're always geeky. Uh, yeah, somebody's got to be. <laughs> so we're going to look at three specific movement patterns. And these are probably uh, very familiar to you, but they're good examples of the 20 plus patterns that exist. So the first one on the left is called the moral reflex. Now, all three of these patterns uh, emerge in utero, and they have responsibility for helping in the birthing process. But each one of them also has an important function after birth. And the moral reflex is what allows the baby to take its first breath of life. The doctor, or more likely the nurse, delivers the baby. And it reaches, oh, there's a nurse in the audience. <laughs> She's like, that's me. And it reaches its body back and opens up its lungs and takes the first breath of life. And later the baby curls up into the fetal position. That's the other side of the moro. Now the first few months of life, it's a protective mechanism, right? It tells us when the baby is wet and tired and hungry and wet, and tired, and hungry, and wet, and tired, and hungry. But later, that reflex integrates, it becomes part of our survival toolbox, and in an adult, that startle reflex becomes the fight or flight reflex to keep us from danger for our whole lives. The second reflex is called the ATNR, the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex. And don't worry, I'll save the quizzes for my students. You don't have to remember that. But when a baby turns its head, it goes into this adorable little fencer pose. It's one of my favorites. Don't ask me to hold that too long. Now, in the birthing process, it helps with the corkscrew movement of getting through the birth canal. But after birth, it's responsible for breathing for the infant when it's on its tummy. It differentiates the head from the neck and shoulders develops bilaterality, so I can use both sides of my body equally. But it also develops the auditory processing system and phonological processing, for you teachers, that's phonics, which are so necessary for speech development and reading later on. And the third one is called um, the symmetrical tonic neck reflex, or STNR. Now you look at that and you say, well, that's crawling, and you're right. Now on the other side of the pond, they call it creeping. We changed it in the US just to be unique. <laughs> Now, this does help our babies get around, but while they're down there crawling their little hearts out, they're also developing the corpus callosum, the white matter between the two hemispheres of the brain. And everything in the body and the brain is contralateral. Every message in the brain has to go across that corpus callosum. So it's very important that it's developed fully. It also differentiates the head and the shoulders and the legs from the trunk so we can use them freely and learn how to salsa dance when we're older or not. <laughs> It also develops the far and near point vision system, so we can look from the board to our paper, from the board to our paper, and read at near point and do schoolwork later on. Now you may ask, what do these reflex patterns have to do with a child with ADD or autism? Everything. It has everything to do with them. 70 years worth of research in primitive reflex patterns by folks around the world like Glenn Doman in the United States, Sally Goddard in the UK, my favorite, Svetlana Muscatova out of Poland, have demonstrated that issues with emergence, maturity, and integration of primitive reflex patterns are 
partially responsible for lack of, uh, for developmental delay, sensory processing disorders, poor motor coordination, learning disabilities, that these are caused in part by a lack of development and organization of the brain. I'll say that again. These are caused in part by a lack of organization and development in the brain, which is achieved through those very movement patterns I just showed you. Now, this is my friend Alex, just a little bundle of joy, also nine years old. Now, unlike Joey, he went through his developmental stages, but when I assessed him, his reflexes were still present, and I'll show you that in just a minute. So at the age of nine, he wasn't reading at all, couldn't even identify all of his letters, very poor motor control, very anxious young man, wouldn't even go upstairs on his own, significant speech issues and a very limited vocabulary. And he even drooled. His mom was um, always wiping the sides of his mouth because he drooled without knowing it. But in, when he went back to school in August, which was only five months later, using this technique, he was reading at a second grade level. He learned to swim spontaneously. He had an explosion in speech and vocabulary. He was putting himself to bed. Bye, Mom. Upstairs he goes. And he was beginning to grasp mathematical concepts, such as patterns, for the first time in his life. <coughs> So if these patterns don't emerge, as in Joey's case, or they don't mature and integrate, as in Alex's case, we can see a wide variety of issues, from mild to profound, depending on the child. And those will vary from a lack of speech, to low muscle tone, hand flapping and toe walking, hyperactivity, excessive meltdowns and tantrums, even uh, learning disabilities, particularly reading disabilities. Now, any teacher can tell you that this is exactly what we're seeing in our classrooms today. And I would like you to consider that as a society, perhaps our babies and our toddlers and our young children are not getting enough of or the right kind of movement that their brains need to develop. And I'll give you a perfect example. We've created these amazing things that we put our babies in to keep them safe called car seats. And we even designed them so we can put them in the stroller without taking the baby out. So we put them in the car, and then we drive to the mall, and we unclick them, click, and then we put them in the stroller, click, and then we drive, we drive around the mall for a couple of hours, we bring them back, click, and then they fall asleep in the car, thank goodness, and you don't ever wake Joey when he's sleeping, and you take him out of the car, and you get home, and you let him sleep again. The whole time he's there, though, he's in this 45-degree angle that does not exist in nature. <laughs> right, that is kind of funny when you say it out loud. And he has no ability to do the... Uh, very complex motor movements that are responsible for mapping on his brain. Now, please do not send me any hate mail. I am not saying that car seats cause brain damage or autism. But I am asking us to consider that perhaps our babies aren't getting the tummy time, and our infants and young children are not getting the time to crawl, leap, roll, and tumble that they need to develop their brains. Now, we've established that there's a connection between motor movements and brain development. It's dependent upon that. But how would that work? How would someone like me or another practitioner take a child like Joey or Alex and move them forward? Well, the brain, nope, the body tells the neurological story. So I can watch the way a child walks, and I can look at their posture, if they're leaning, what their feet are doing. Or I can ask them to take a particular movement and how they react tells me about that reflex pattern. I'll show you two very quick examples. You remember the Moro reflex, right? So if I ask a child to turn their feet out, for those of you in the back, if the Moro reflex is active, you'll see their body open up like this. And if I ask them to point their toes in, their body will come like this. For the ATNR, that cute little fencer pose, if they put their arms out and turn their head, one arm will drop. And I know that it's active. So using movements that simulate what an infant would do, we can activate that genetic code, remember? Our DNA knows what it's supposed to do. So I always start with rocking motions because those are the first motions that infants make in utero. And as, a, as an infant, what do we do? We rock, we rock, we rock. And this does two things. It pushes cerebral spinal fluid up around the brain, but it also activates that brain stem to start its journey. And by using these methodologies, we can see an improvement in coordinated and synchronous movement, improved auditory and visual skills, better attention and focus, improved speech, reading gains, and my favorite, wissitness. 
Oftentimes, that's the first thing the parents say to me, like, he just seems more with it. Well, yes, we woke up a sleeping brain, and that's what happens. And I want you to know that these reflex patterns stay with us over our lifespan. So once they've matured and integrated, they become part of our survival toolbox. So even as an adult, if you experience something like a trauma or an injury or an assault or um, traumatic brain injury, a stroke or combat, your brain has about 20 patterns to pull from to support you through that. The same ones that developed it to begin with. The one you know best is the fight or flight mechanism. But if they get stuck on, they can have very detrimental effects to our functioning, even affecting the way our immune system works. And our young men and women returning from combat are stuck in these survival patterns. They can be released through movement, but that in and of itself is another talk altogether. To wrap it up today, I want to come back to Joey. A week after I saw him for the first time, I walked in the door and his mom says, what did you do to my son? From around the corner. <laughs> and I got little tears in my eyes like, oh my gosh, what did I do? Did I hurt him? Like, no, you did the right thing. You know how to do this. It's okay. And I turned the corner. She has a huge smile on her face. She's like, I don't know what you did to my son. But two days after our first session, he rolled over by himself. Mm. That's the brain. I was just there. And I got different tears in my eyes, and I smiled, and I thought, yeah, you know, movement, simple movement, the power to reverberate through a child's body, to change their brain, that's real. And that, my friends, is hope. Thank you. <laughs>